Okay, and now I remember. Yeah, my neighbor, my neighbor just started mowing his lawn. <laughs> yeah, it's usually a leaf blower or a lawn mower is what we've been getting lately. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'll start again. Uh, this is the backward design and online course um, courses workshop and backward design is is a is, is a part of a, a bigger thing by Wiggins and McTie, um, two authors who um, work in education and pedagogy and they have for quite some time. Um, and what they've developed from backward design is actually uh, called understanding by design. And as you were saying before, it's kind of like re reverse engineering. Um, sometimes it's been called, you know, reverse systems thinking along those lines. So basically it's starting at the end and, and working backward as it implies. So, okay. So when you start designing uh, in this backward design process, um, you wanna make sure that you're identifying your results first. Um, in other words, the question you should always ask yourself is, what do I want students to know or understand and be able to do so that you can have a destination? Because that's typically, uh, historically, a lot of instructors have actually started planning by learning activities or using the textbook as a guide um, and then matching their outcomes to that and then their assessments to that. Um, but if we wanna really assess what students are learning and can do, um, we need to know where we're going. So we know where we're going, but now we need to know what we're going to collect as evidence that they've made it there. So the next step in the process would be to check what they have learned and that's you know developing your assessments. Um, we recommend having frequent assessments, you know, uh, formative assessments throughout the throughout the semester with a couple of big summative assessments. Those would be your, you know, midterm and your final or a presentation or a, you know, portfolio. And then the final step in backward design is um, now you're going to plan those learning experiences. And I think a lot of confusion sometimes comes up between what the learning experience is and what the assessment is. So, for example, a learning experience would be watch this video, read this, uh, th read this article, the things that they're actually participating in, whereas the assessment would be what are they presenting to you as evidence that they've actually learned from that material. So again, like I had mentioned before, we want to make sure that we're starting with our outcomes in mind. And Let's go to our next slide. There are seven different tenets to um, understanding by design. I know this is a lot of text, um, but just to kind of point out some of the key points within those seven tenets. Um, when, when teachers or professors are thinking purposely about the curriculum, then they are able to offer a little bit more flexibility um, as to a learning process, um, and it kind of lending itself to that under uh, the universal design for learning. So you can offer multiple ways for students to demonstrate that learning. Um, for example, I know that there's, you know, there's a professor on campus who says you can either type this up or you can record a video for me. And those are the two things that you can present to demonstrate your learning. It also helps to focus on the teaching aspect um, and figure out how you can help students move to such an understanding that they can transfer that understanding into a real world application. Um, when they are able to take what they've learned and apply that or transfer that through an authentic performance or a submission of some sort, um, this can serve as almost an indicator of mastery. So this is how we know that they've got it and they're ready to go in, and go out into the world and do this on their own. Um, this next one, <laughs> if, you're, if you're developing, you know, backward design, understanding by design, and you're starting with that end in mind and you're planning that long-term, um, so your semester, this is going to help professors avoid using the textbook as the curriculum rather than a resource that supports the curriculum or, or guides students to that uh, learning objective. So this, and honestly, it happens in K-12 as well, um, where you know, you're presented with a textbook and I'm gonna teach chapter one to chapter 
10 and that's my curriculum. But what, what happens is, um, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, is there isn't a lot of prioritizing of uh, enduring understanding. And we'll talk about that in a little later too. Um, so basically it's just whatever the textbook company says is important. And sometimes you only get through chapter five and you don't, uh, you don't get to the end of that chapter or the textbook. Yeah. Um, and then this last one is probably the most near and dear to my heart is that teachers are coaches. They coach students through that understanding. Does that include lecture? Yes. Does that include individual consultation or workshop? Yes. But it's basically as a coach's job, it, or as a professor's job as a coach, it would be to you know, make sure that that student is moving, making forward progress. And I think that at St. Rose, because it's so small, we have that opportunity. And I, I have seen many uh, professors take advantage of following that student through this learning, this learning process. I hate when I use this. There we go. So this is what I was talking about with beginning in the, with that end in mind. And I love this, this diagram because what this does is it helps instructors to prioritize what they're teaching. So chapter three in the textbook may have information that's enduring understanding. In other words, some important, the important ideas that are core processes to that discipline, and they will have a longer lasting value. So obviously like reading comprehension for, for, for younger students, that is an enduring, con, uh, enduring understanding. Um, and again, as we you know, talk about this, our end goal is transfer. So if it's enduring, they can transfer it. Um, then the, if you prioritize your outcomes and your goals, you wanna know the knowledge that's most necessary in direct context for that enduring understanding. So in order for them to have that enduring understanding, what is it important for them to know and be able to do as a foundation to that? And then finally, the worth being familiar with. This is, if I get to it in the semester, that's great. If I don't, these are things that you know may come up again in the future for the student. Um, so it's you know big picture, the broad strokes. Uh, you want to be. I don't know how to say this. Not as in depth of instruction with with this circle. Yeah. Any questions so far? No, no, that makes sense. The, it's I, I, a lot of the things you're mentioning are things that I've run across in other pedagogical sort of forums. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, I love Wiggins and McTie. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, so this is another piece of their work. And I don't know if you can see it very well. I can actually try to. I can see it OK. OK. Um, so when we talk about that transfer of knowledge, OK, so that's our higher end um, learning. And then we've got our acquiring. So this is where lecture would live. So that's your direct instruction. And the goal of you know this piece of the table is for students to acquire the facts and the basic skills. So it's that foundation um, or the information that they're going to need moving forward. So that's, you know, your, your lectures, graphic organizers for note taking, um, making sure that you're asking convergent questions rather than divergent, any process guides. And one of the, one of the things I've seen actually in a couple of courses when I was at SUNY Oswego is there are some instructors who actually used a close document so they would leave missing words out that they wanted students to fill in while they were taking notes rather than having the student take copious notes um, they really did have to pay attention to what fit where in that close um, document um, and again you know you're going to see feedback and corrections across the board so because that's where most of the learning happens is through feedback and corrections um, as students apply what they've learned so the next step or the next level would be the, the teacher as a facilitator, so facilitative teaching. And this is where the goal of the instructor is to help students construct meaning out of what they've learned in, in the acquisition phase, okay? So in this role, they want to make sure that they're actively engaging students in that process of information. Um, this is, I don't know, there's a lot of research being done right now um, in higher education in active learning and online education. Um, and this is where that kind of lives. It's that having the active participation and the, the collegial dialogue amongst students, community of inquiry. So some of the teaching strategies that you could use, and I am going to go over how you can do some of these things in Canvas at the end. So um, it won't just be a lot of 
words. <laughs> um, so my favorite would be problem based learning. Uh, these could be vignettes. Uh, obviously, in, in, in English, you might not have a lot of problem based learning. Um, mm. But it's one of the things that you could do um, in other areas. Using analogies might be a big one um, for the English uh, discipline. Yeah. More advanced graphic organizers, um, some probing. This is where you would also um, want to, uh, again, get a little bit more depth with that feedback. Um, I like this understanding notebook. Um, this is like a, an ongoing journal. So as the students are going through this, this information or, or, or the, the course, they can you know, keep track of what it is that they are learning and maybe where they're having difficulties. And this can be something that could be shared with the instructor. Mm. Um, and then there was another thing, uh, reflective prompts as well. And that's, I remember my graduate work, it was a whole bunch of reflection. Um, <laughs> in both in both programs so um i think that that is that is the best way to, to get students thinking about their thinking and being able to construct that knowledge and then finally your goal is transfer um and as the instructor you know the goal is to support or coach those students into applying these, this new information um, autonomous, autonomously and in authentic situations. So this is where you may want to have, you know, here's a case study, break it down for me if you're if you're working in social sciences. But if you're working in English, this might be, you know, take this piece of literature and, and I'm not an English teacher, so forgive me, um, and, and analyze, you know, what are the characters' motivations and, and what led up to those mm -hmm. motivations? You know, how, how did their past affect those motivations? Things along those lines. Yeah. Um, or have, have them lead a lecture and on a certain topic. And if yeah. they're leading that lecture, then you can sit with them and say, you know, you know here's your good feedback and here's where you can improve upon that. Mm -hmm. um, this is, again, you've got that feedback. And but in this level, you want to have students taking a look at themselves as well. Where did I fall and where did I you know, excel? And then really helping them find a way out of that. So how can they improve, you know, and suggesting some ways that they can move forward? You know, it's, it's coaching. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it seems like the transfer part, like the thing you were describing about leading a lecture, like I know people to do that in English, mm -hmm. they'll have them sign up to lead a discussion on a particular day. Mm -hmm. um, so that ha definitely happens with other types of presentations, even too, where they get to be the expert in the room. Mm -hmm. I also do, I was thinking about transfer, you could even make a case for, but like writing a final paper as being a mm -hmm. kind of transfer, you know, yeah. it, because if you, a lot of times with my papers, I don't assign the text that they write on, they choose it. Mm -hmm. So they get to choose it and then they're supposed to apply concepts that we've looked at exactly. to that, their reading of that text. So you could even make a case for the paper being like that. Well, I mean, I think in English, the whole workshop process from beginning to end um, yeah. is, is, is part of that. You know, I know that um, I know that there's an instructor on campus who has them perform a poem that they create. You mm -hmm. know, I know that there is... Um, so another instructor on campus who takes all of the information they've learned in history and they have to apply that to a specific situation, um, a, a current situation. So, I, you know, I think that that is, those are ways that you can implement this into the humanities, which is a little bit more difficult. Okay, so the next piece, now that we've designed, now that we've come up with the desired outcome and we've kind of figured out, you know, the levels that are gonna get us to that transfer, taking a look at Bloom's taxonomy. Um, and some people have heard of it, some people have haven't, um, but Bloom's taxonomy is old, <laughs> but, but yeah. it's, it's tried and true. Um, it's tried and true, and it was redone in 2001 by some other um, researchers. Basically, you know, our lower order and thinking skills, those are your basics that are, you know, in the nice to know section. You know, let's make sure that they're getting this information through the lecture and that they can recall that information and they can demonstrate, you know, some understanding of the materials that I'm giving them. It's when you get up into applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating, that's where that move toward transfer actually begins to take place because they're applying something, you're providing feedback and then they can reapply and it, and it may move them to that next level of, now that I've applied this, I can actually take something else apart and analyze it. And then, you know, eventually 
I can, you know, create my own product uh, based on everything that I've learned. Um, Project-based learning actually and problem-based learning fit right into this. So project-based learning is a little bit more like you were just speaking about with, you know, a final paper. If that's something that, you know, they have to start the third week of the semester and they have to do it, you know, for the entire semester, you know, whether it be a creative writing piece or, or whatnot, um, that's more of a, a project-based learning scenario. So using those verbs to, to make sure that you are, uh, creating learning objectives that are measurable is very important. And I think one of the things that uh, many instructors, you know, <laughs> you know, pre-K to, you know, death <laughs> um, deal with is they, the, crafting a learning objective is difficult to get that measurable part in there. You know, we want to say the student will understand this topic. Well, how do we know they, they understand that? They have to actually demonstrate that. So the measurable verbs, like they're going to be the things that help, whether it be define, analyze, um, determine, judge, evaluate, those are the things that are going to be measurable through our assessments. When we're creating our assessments, we wanna make sure that we are asking ourselves these two questions. Are the performances and products going to reveal the evidence of meaning making and transfer. So whatever we're asking them to do as an assessment, is it going to be evidence that they've met that learning objective that we've created? And in order to do that, you have to make sure that your assessment questions are aligned to those outcomes and objectives that you've just worked so hard on. So now we're gonna move into the Canvas part. So this is kind of where, you know, teaching and teaching online kind of split off a little bit. I mean, they're still very similar, but the tools that are available in both of them differ. So let's talk about in an online course. If we're going to be assessing learning, whether it be formative or summative, you know, we could have uh, using the assignment tool, <clears throat> excuse me, a paper submission or a video. This could be you know, some kind of performance and I, I or uh, it could be a recording their metacognition as they're, you know, as they're reading um, or as they're writing something, you know, thinking about what they're thinking and recording themselves thinking it. Um, presentations or, you know, voice thread. Voice thread's not going away. We, we tried, but it's not going away. <laughs> we tried like the Dickens. Um, like, there's people we would have to, we'd have to pull it from their cold dead hands. <laughs> at this oh, point geez. so it's staying uh -huh. well, um, it's yeah. you, you say that because the voice thread is something i used for a little while and i think dan nestor kind of turned me on to it originally but it's something that i kind of stopped using as much this year and i, I didn't have any strong reasons why i just found other things that did mm -hmm. what i wanted more um but i'm wondering i i, I maybe not now but at some point i'll just find out what's what's the story of like why why should we should get rid of it well, I, I, I got him to break up with it, so we're good. Yeah. Okay, good. good. <laughs> um, I think it's just, it's a tool that's been around since like 2005. Yeah. So um, it's just, I mean, some people find it quite useful for their discipline. Yeah. So that's why we're not getting rid of it. Yeah. I mean, I like, I like, the, I, I like, obviously it facilitates discussion. And I like the fact that you, they can submit multimedia. Mm -hmm. That's like the best part of it. And that was something that other tools that I used didn't really do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't, you know, didn't, I, I wasn't wedded to it. Well, now what we have, you know, with Kaltura um, is the ability to submit multimedia to a discussion. Yeah. So, and then that could facilitate discourse that way, or if they're going to do a presentation, have them post it as a discussion and then have students, you know, yeah. discuss it. So the next tool obviously would be the Canvas discussions tool. Mm. There's another tool out there called Flipgrid. And I haven't really gotten much traction on it, but it's a way to have um, an asynchronous video discussion. Um, it has, it's a third party tool, but we can't install it as, as a whole. But if it's something that you would be interested in learning about, it's just one more way um, for there to be uh, a more media based discussion, but it is asynchronous. And then obviously the, uh, the last assessment tool in uh, Canvas would be uh, the quizzes tool. 
Okay, so now if we move on to those those levels that we just talked about as far as um, you know direct instruction and making meaning and transfer. So as we said, direct instruction that's going to be to acquire those facts. And the ways you could do that as an instructor would be create recorded lectures. Now, I know that in some of like, for example, in Flex, they're recording their entire two hour lecture. Um, but one of the things that, you know, is is helpful to students is if you have a 40 minute, usually a 40 minute lecture in a face to face course, you know, you could split that up into, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe two 15 minute lectures, because you're not going to have all of that discussion happening. And a pre recorded lecture has a level of quality that a live recorded lecture doesn't. Um, because you can edit, you've got a good background, you know, you've got your earphones in, you're not moving around the room. So those are all things that contribute to students learning through a, a lecture online. As I mentioned before, graphic organizers are those guide notes, and those would just be, you know, items that you put um, in a module for them to download, and then they could either submit them for feedback or they can just have them to keep. This one I don't think pe many people take advantage of, but this is a great strategy, and that's uh, for for uh, building that community of inquiry because you've got students who are asking questions, taking notes, gleaning out different pieces of information from that lecture, and that would be to do collaborative note taking. Because the students have access to Google Docs, um, professors can create a Google Doc for them using the collaborations tool in Canvas. And what it does is it makes a copy for certain groups. So if you've got you know, note-taking group A, note-taking group B, note-taking group C, you can create three collaborative groups, one Google Doc, and they can go in and they can take their notes. Um, that way, it's kind of like crowdsourcing the information because I know I miss things that maybe my neighbor didn't. I mean, um, the peruse all for that as well. In, yes, in yep. Um, I have peruse all on the next um, section because that okay. I, I use that more as a discussion. Yeah, um, it kind of serves a little bit of both. It's mostly mm -hmm. discussion, but you can imagine that if you directed students to in more in a note-taking way, that it would also allow people to see, oh, this person highlighted this. I didn't even think about that part. True. You know? Yeah, true, true. I'm actually teaching my first time this fall. And yeah, I'm going to use right. peruse all for one of the texts. So I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, I love it. <clears throat> um, the other thing would be demonstrations. So, you know, I know that there's people in, especially in math and science and computer, computer science and, and over in the School of Business where they have simulation software. Obviously, in the humanities, that's not necessarily going to be available. But there could be, you know, demonstrations or presentations that could be made by videotaping um, using Kaltura videotaping. Mm -hmm creating video through Kaltura. Um, this one, I think, in the humanities, it would be great because it would be, you know, recording you thinking what you're thinking while you're reading a text and not necessarily making it super formal, but like, okay, this piece means this to me and here's what I'm thinking as I'm reading it. And that kind of models to the student um, in, a, in a direct instruction kind of way, you know, the thought process that you might wanna have to get to that end. And then, as we mentioned before, there's the feedbacks, feedback and corrections, and that can be done in SpeedGrader quite easily. I love SpeedGrader. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. It's, <clears throat> it's, it's definitely the best thing like that that I've run in running into, like way better mm -hmm. than anything Blackboard had. So I think if you see, just to, just to kind of look at a balance. So we have, you know, a decent list here. So this is, a, this is a percentage of our instruction. And then if we were to shift and look at this one, you see we've got a little bit more in this level of learning. Mm -hmm. So this is probably where the bulk of our instruction or the bulk of the uh, learning is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, and this is that second column, the facilitating teaching and constructing meaning. So this is where you might wanna use the discussions tool or voice thread for a Socratic seminar um, <coughs> or if you can if you can find some other uh, live way for them to do a Socratic seminar, that would be, you know, maybe using Zoom and having small groups sign up for, you know, a time where they're going to meet, not necessarily with you, but as a group and, you know, record what they're talking about. Teaching with analogies, you could do, you know, use your discussion tool to post those. Um, or, you know, in the Kaltura video quizzes, 
There are, you know, reflection points that you can put in there. So it stops at a point in the video and you can add something for them to reflect upon. Or there's open-ended questions that you can put within that timeline as well. So you might want to insert an analogy of some sort and have them respond to that. Um, this is one that's kind of timeless, K-12 and in um, upper and in, in higher education. And that's a, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped over perusal. So, you know, they purchase their text through perusal. They can do note-taking or discussion through that. Um, but the next one, Jigsaw, this one's kind of fun. Um, using the Canvas Collaborations tool um, and Google Docs, what you would do is separate students into groups, maybe, you know, three or four, depending on the size of your, your class. I mean, sometimes there's only five kids, five students in the class. So, um, so you would have them be in these collaborative groups using the Canvas collaborations. You would give them that Google Doc like we talked about, you know, in the, in the last section. And then each group has a different article or a piece of reading that they need to take a look at, analyze, and then teach that to their peers through a video submission. Um, <clears throat> So it would be, you know, three or four students taking a look at that article, picking it apart, looking for what you want them to look for, and then coming back and recording a group video that then teaches the other students about what they've just read. <clears throat> Sorry about this. <clears throat> That's okay. Obviously, the reflection prompts we talked about before, those ongoing reflective journals, this can be done in two different ways. It could be you create a template in, in Google Docs and you can share that template individually with students and they and then you can use that to comment on their on their reflections as you go. Or using the groups tool in Canvas, you can create individual discussions. So student A is assigned this discussion and it's a discussion between the two of you. So that's an ongoing way. It's an ongoing journal rather than using the inbox because that can tend to get flooded. It would basically be each student gets a discussion um, assignment and then that ongoing journal can go out through the semester. <clears throat> and then probing. So participating in discussions as an instructor in the community of inquiry. So not necessarily faking it, um, but being somebody who's also inquiring about a topic rather than that rather than responding to a student you know with with yes you're right and here's why or have you thought about this but also you know yeah that's something i've wondered in the past or um here's some i i wonder how we can solve this problem together but basically just being part of that learning yeah. community rather than the, when the instructor honestly that's I think, at least in my classroom, that's 90% of what I do Good. when it comes to discussions, rather than, because with English, it's harder to find a moment where you're like, yes, that's the correct answer. Right, know? yes. <laughs> so. I, I think probably um, philosophy instructor that I know yeah. probably does a lot of this as well. <laughs> <laughs> but it's valuable because it gets them it to across the text and not, you know. Well, and it's those, it's, it's the uh, evaluate um, and analyze on blooms. I mean, you, that's kind of where you guys all live. Yeah. So then finally, there's, you know, that coaching section that we talked about where, you know, you want to make sure that you're providing that specific feedback and context, um, and then prompting that self-reflection. And the ways you can do that would be, you know, through speed grader, um, individual Zoom meetings, not necessarily office hours. I think one of the things that I'm toying with for this fall semester is for participation, I'd like you to make at least one individual point with me via Zoom. Mm. And we can talk about whatever it is that you need to talk about with regard to, you know, this information. Mm. And that could be, you know, it, it could be here, let's go over your writing. Let's, you know, what are you struggling with? Where are you, where are you uh, hitting those roadblocks? Mm. But you know, here's where you're doing well as well. And then making sure that you've got things built into your course for self-reflection. And we did talk about reflecting pa reflection papers, but also um, you can use quizzes as kind of a survey. <clears throat> so every week, you know, students can kind of create a, or fill out a survey. You know, here's what I struggled with this week. Here's what I've been thinking about. Here's where I'd like to go next in my writing. Do you have any suggestions? Things along those lines. 
And then that's another way for them to really be consulting with you, not necessarily in real time. Um, and the last one, video journals or blogs. So they would record in, in, in Kaltura, but they could post it in a blog or something. So I'm, you know, as I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about those students who, you know, go through and their majors in Italian and they and they their culminating thing is they get to go to Italy for a semester and they create video blogs or they create written blogs about the experience. And I think that this is a good, that's a good way to have students get to that transfer because everything that they've learned, they're now putting to use in the real world. So I think that is the last slide and I'm gonna stop recording. And if there is anything that you want to talk more about, we can 